Hi, everybody. We're back. This is Dave Vellante of Wikibon.org. I'm here with at Stu. Stu Miniman is my co-host today. We've been going wall-to-wall -wall coverage. This is day two. We're at IBM Edge. Inhi Cho Su is here, a Cube alum, good friend of the Cube. Welcome back. Great to see you again. Thank you, Dave. So I'm excited to be here. Second year of Edge. You know, we were down at Orlando last year. It's less than half of the folks here, so we're, we're excited to see the, the growth. That's, that's oh yeah, amazing. we had to get a bigger facility. 4,700 plus folks in attendance this year. We had 2,000 in Orlando. I liked Orlando, but yeah. uh, it's been interesting, the uh, the broader mix of audience here at this event. Yeah, so talk about that a little bit. It's not just a storage audience, right? Oh, far from it. Um, you know, the, the day one session topics were really about data, cloud, and results. Results around the business, results around the economics, and we talked about uh, data economics, and one of the topics was, you know, there's a tipping point. You've heard of the tipping point, right? At some sure. point, what happens? Well, what's interesting is, historically, as data volumes increased, what would happen? Performance systems would degradate. What we're saying is actually, the notion is as you add more data, you actually get more context. And as you add more data, if you leverage capabilities like Flash, the economics change. Your performance fundamentally increases, and the cost actually decrease. So that's the new tipping point. Yeah, I know we heard a lot of talk. There was a lot of chat on Twitter about, you know, the dollar per gigabyte should really be focused on dollar per I.O. And, and I sort of chimed in and said, you know, really the metric is a, should be about business value. Yeah, right? so I don't think it's I.O. Point. I think it's dollar per workload, right? It's really the workload. Are yeah. you optimizing for the workload? So one of the questions we actually got from a client is, you know, if you're going to uh, embark on, for example, a big data project around Hadoop, and are you going to use uh, really, you know, scaled out servers, distributed memory, or are you going to have a direct attached storage? And the answer is, it actually depends on the workload and what you actually want to do with it. You know, are you going to use it for inline production type activities, or are you just doing it to do sandbox activity just to kick the tires, or just you don't care about the nature of the data, or you don't care about necessarily the uh, security or backup availability, then that changes. So. So it's it was about interesting, the we were talking off camera, had Ambush Goyal on yesterday, and you know him well, and, 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 and have He's a brilliant guy. Yeah, yes. he really is, and, and what I love about him is he's, he's embracing this disruption. Because on the one hand, you got oh, yeah. the dupe, on the other hand, you got the Amazon, you know, AWS cloud factor, and it's aimed right at his business that he just took over six months ago, and he just smiles and, and loves it. It, you know, it, in his keynote, he talked about he wants to take away the word storage right. and, and replace it with the word data because it's actually what that is the value for most clients. And it's what you want to do with it, managing data and moving up the scale in terms of the value. So you're at the heart of that disruption in he, which is a good place to be. Um, and it's like these traditional lines, even organizational lines are starting to, to blur. They're changing within the customer base. What are you seeing there? Oh, um, data is a hot space, right? Everyone's talking about big data. Uh, what's interesting is, is um, I actually gave a presentation earlier today around big data myths. You know, what are the myths? Well, it's only about volume. It's not about volume. We talked about it. There are other Vs. There's a lot more complexity. Um, we've talked about, oh, is big data doesn't include transactional data. Uh, that's not true. Most, actually, majority of big data implementations include integrating transactional data. Why? Because that's actually how most of the world operates in terms of business operations. And you want to integrate that with new data sources, new data types, to actually make measurable impact at the point of contact. So it's, it's, uh, it's interesting, the conversations that are coming up and, and all that we're covering. Yeah, let's talk about that a little bit. I mean, the notion of, of bringing together uh, analytic and transactional data, we've talked about a little bit about in the past. Um, what are you seeing some of your customers do in that regard? Oh, um, sure. Uh, probably a few use cases. Um, I would say a couple use cases. One is uh, data warehouse augmentation is probably one of the um, dominant use cases where we've seen where clients have said, you know what, I want to either do one of two things. I either want to have a landing area to land a lot of data and use technologies like Hadoop as a pre-process kind of landing area before I target it to an operational uh, data warehouse or data store or database. Or you have it in conjunction with the warehouse or database to do active archiving, right? Why active? Well, the nature of what we do and how we live, you don't actually know sometimes how to tier the data appropriately. 
and you don't know when it's going to be needed or when that context or the value of the data is going to be relevant to the particular queries that you're going to run at a given time. So we're seeing a lot more um, interaction around transactional data, around data warehouse augmentation. In addition, we're seeing it especially in real-time fraud, right? Why? Because what you're trying to do is run an analytic in the middle and in interrupt, depending on the query you're doing, interrupt a transaction that may be happening. You swipe the card and before you fully process that transaction to hit someone's bill, you want to ensure that that really was the right person in the right geographic location and that transaction wasn't done in, you know, 3,000 miles away in another location. Um, you used to take six months to figure that out. <laughs> yeah, now, I mean, I get a call from... You get a letter. <laughs> oh, I don't even get a letter. I actually get no, a six text. Months ago, six years ago, it took oh. six months to get a letter. Remember? Yes. You get a letter. Oh, you might have been hacked. Right, so yeah. what happens now? Oh, now I get text, yeah. I get an email, I get a call. Um, I especially get calls when I'm traveling internationally. I love getting it via text because then I'm not interrupted as I'm doing it and I can text back and say, yep, it's a valid transaction, I made that purchase. If I'm traveling internationally, when I get a call, it's quite nice. You know, are you sure you want to make that uh, extra shoe purchase? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> kidding. How about, <laughs> sort of. Um, <laughs> how about streams? What you guys are doing in streams is really interesting. It's sort of a new model, right? You're, yeah. you're actually making, helping clients make decisions on data before you even persist that, that data. Yep. Um, and, and that's a trend that uh, somewhat, let's see, I think it came out of IBM Research, that technology. Oh, right? yeah. You might have done an acquisition there as well, I can't really no, remember. No, 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 this IBM is Research, pure right? organic yeah, investment. Okay. It is one of um, This is pretty cool stuff. So to explain to us what, what this is all about. So, so how does it all work and what is it and how are you applying it? The genesis of Streams actually started with um, an investment around security intelligence in terms of the use case and really protecting citizens. Um, one of the things we realized, um, and uh, for a lot of different organizations, was that they actually have a lot of data in-house. And if they had the ability to make sense of it in real time, that they could actually prevent disasters from happening. So how do you do that? How, how do you correlate data sets that are incredibly varied, generated by not only video surveillance, text, email, um, taking into consideration GPS locations, taking into consideration identity of individuals to resolve all of that, and then do that as it's coming at you. So if I use a simple analogy like water, water in a river, water in a lake, water in a waterfall, Streams is the only technology in the industry that can actually analyze water moving as fast as waterfall and pick out the one piece that actually matters and take out the noise of the waterfall. Whereas, historically, if you think about Hadoop and other types of operational systems, it's either a river flow or it's a lake, right? The water's fairly static, meaning the data's static. The data may change, but the, the speed at which it's falling down is not the pace of waterfall. So, Streams is really bad. Yeah, I, I wish our CTO, David Floyer, was here, because actually he's done looked at some of the, the big streams out uh, there. Um, and really, we feel that this is the intersection of kind of the big data wave and the transformation of traditional infrastructure. Um, so, it kind of brings together, you know, what IT was doing and uh, where it needs to go. So, it's a pr pretty right. fascinating well, you know, technology. When you analyze data that's moving, uh, information that's moving in motion. Uh, that's actually the value. So why do you need to move the data, right? One of the fundamental benefits is to leave the data where it is and learn to analyze the data in place or analyze the data while it's in movement, even before it lands. So, so, uh, I'm, so I'm wondering- this is how we process as human beings. What, right? What's your thought on kind of the industrial internet, internet of things or internet of everything uh, meme that's going on in the, in the industry oh, right now? That, you know what, Streams is actually one of the core technologies that clients are using to leverage the, what I would consider the machine generated da data, right? What you're talking about is infrastructure and there's two, two dimensions to it. One is process efficiency, operational process, workflow process, um, asset optimization. Another aspect is most companies are generating a lot of insights, a lot of data, but they don't actually know how to monetize it. And part of monetizing it means you need to understand when you use those insights in context at the point of impact. Mm -hmm. For example, in life insurance or any insurance industry. You know, life-changing moments is when you actually rethink your benefits, healthcare benefits, uh, family benefits, I'm getting married, I'm about to have a baby, I just wrecked my car, I'm switching jobs. 
in that moment, you're probably more apt to consider your insurance policies than you are at any other time because mm -hmm. it's a life-changing moment, but life-changing moments happen in point situations and you need to be listening and active to understand it or real-time CDR mediation or understanding you're standing next to a mobile billboard and people know that you're going to be more apt to certain types of um, brands and products and the mobile billboard automatically shifts based on your physical presence next to it. Okay, so we've talked about a couple of you know, commercial use cases. What about, um, let's talk a little bit more about the application of this technology in things like security, facial mm. rec recognition. Is that something that's actually happening today or is that kind of a, a future? Uh, it's, uh, security is a huge aspect. Um, security intelligence, um, fraud detection, really learning to kind of minimize the risk. Um, in terms of what I would consider uh, political and geographic sort of securities uh, in terms of political boundaries, geographic boundaries. Um, there's a company called Global Terra Echoes who's actually leveraging our streaming capabilities. They're embedding uh, uh, fiber optic optic cables underground and we're sensing that in real time so typically to do perimeter per, uh, perimeter surveillance what would you do you'd have either video cameras or you'd have people you know man kind of the outside perimeter or you have helicopters come up and down and observe now because of the sensing ability we can actually see when a squirrel passes when a human passes when an object passes and based on heat radiation based on weight size airflow who it, who's there and who's not there. Um, and it, it's a completely different dimension. Or the ability to analyze something that's going on in one part of the world at the same time something else is happening. Because the physics of, of, of objects is that we physically cannot be in two places at the same time. Right? Not yet, anyway. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> Did they do that on Star Trek? I don't know. I don't think Beat so. Me even, up, Scotty. even Star Trek couldn't do that. But, uh, Okay, so one of the talks you're giving here was uh, big data, how to get started. So a lot of clients say, you know, big data, you know, big data is big money, but is that a myth? Is that a reality? Is it a future promise? What are, what are customers asking you in terms of the how to get started question? Is it how do I actually get value out of my data? Is it how do I actually deploy the technology? What are the, what are the big questions that you're getting? Probably uh, the two questions I'm getting is one around um, where should I start, meaning what use cases are kind of demonstrating real ROI and results. That gets to your point about value. And then we've determined that there's five dominant use cases that we've seen clients actually be quite successful in starting from. And then the second piece is, do I have the right skills in-house to get this stuff up and running? And the skills could be quite varied. The skills could be around, uh, do I have the analytic skills, the um, uh, applied math skills to write uh, both the queries, um, data mining skills, it could be visualization techniques because once you get to larger pools of data, to consume it um, can take quite a bit of time. Or do I have uh, data integration and quality and governance and privacy skills to ensure that I'm actually putting the right governance around how that's being accessed and touched. So, so what else is exciting you? Let's see, uh, DB2 is pretty exciting, right? It's got oh. a nice facelift uh, in April. Really. Oh my gosh. So talk this about is that a little bit. I, I could, you've got hours? Yeah. <laughs> I love it, love it. Um, we've just uh, announced a capability and are delivering it is uh, DB2 with Blue Acceleration. It is our new in column memory, uh, sorry, in memory column store processing. I'm so excited, I can't get the words out. Uh, column or processing capabilities in our database. So, unique aspects of it. One of it is what we call adaptive compression. So we can actually compress the data down by an order of 10x, 10x, so like 10 terabytes looks like one terabyte. In addition to that, we can have the ability to keep most of that data in the compressed state and run the analytics on the compressed state. Right? Most analytic tools require you to uncompress the data, recompress the data, so you really don't get the storage savings or the time efficiency when you're running the queries. The second piece we've seen is what we call uh, leveraging the capabilities of the hardware around vector processing. So you can do single instruction and then uh, drive a single instruction for a query and then run it across the multiple threads of a system. That's also enabling you to quickly get the results back. The other aspect we've also applied is uh, this method of data skipping. So it can actually skip large orders, uh, large sets of data and maintain the order of the query so that you get the results back faster. Now, what does this really mean in terms of real end user benefit? We're talking on the order of 100 to 1,000 times 
faster for individual queries. We've seen eight to 25 times faster for entire workloads. Um, we actually did a, a demo here. I was excited to do a main tent demo. We showed Blue with Cognos with a uh, flash system 820 running on two nodes of a power um, 780 and the load time, we put in over uh, a terabyte of data, I think it was like three billion rows, uh, 20 million dimensions, all under less than 12 minutes, and as you're running the queries in the product dimensions, like it's, it's, it's moving as fast as you can think. It's moving as fast as you're moving the clicker. There was no hourglass, Tick tock, tick tock. Wait for your so report. So you, you put the entire <laughs> database in Flash in that in that demo. Is that right? Uh, in that de demo, we actually had a split. Um, okay. We used uh, some Flash and we also had some uh, a mix of uh, SSDs, but it was mostly uh, Flash. Yeah. Okay, but m most of the the, the yeah, database yeah. is running on semiconductor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. And then we also did a, a demo also using uh, PureScale, DB2 PureScale, because you're really going to see the Flash benefits when it's mm. an I/O intensive workload, right? First of all, Flash will make anything faster, but the order of magnitude on an I.O. intensive workload, especially around transactional systems, are going to be just ridiculous. So, so speaking of databases, IBM made an announcement today with Mongo uh, in the NoSQL space. Yes. Can you give us a little color on that? Yeah, you know, this is about IBM's commitment just in, in general around the open source community and also with OpenStack. And we're adopting and understanding that clients are going to need new capabilities in order to um, prepare for new types of application development. We've actually added uh, JSON NoSQL support within both DB2 and Informix as well. Um, in addition to that, we also wanted to partner with Mongo because of um, what they've done in terms of the community and advancements around cloud-based application sets and some mobile-based application development. Yeah, okay, so the Mongo has obviously been focused on that JSON integration for a while, kind of the leader oh, there, yeah, so yeah. it's a big moment for them. They must be excited. We're actually doing... Is it next week, Stu? Next Friday in New York City. We're doing the Mongo DB conference, yep. uh, which would be great with uh, the guys from 10 Gen. So Jeff ah, Kelly excellent. and I will be down there next Friday. Excellent. I'll be uh, driving the cube down from Marlboro. That'll be great. Good, uh, <laughs> good action down there. You're know, everywhere. I know, East yeah, Coast, no, West it's Coast. It's crazy, isn't it? I don't know if people from IBM will be there, but we'll definitely get them on if, uh, if in fact they are. So that's cool. Um, okay, good. In he. Amazing. Did we miss anything? Let's see. We covered uh, so much. What's next for you? Where are you, where, where are you off to next? You got, Wherever uh, you are. Yeah, okay. Well, hopefully we'll be at IOD. We'll see you at IOD. We'll I don't see know if we'll see you, you before yes. that, but uh, we've got a long summer coming up ahead of us. So, well, nice job. You know, this is always great to talk to you and love the enthusiasm. How many, how many keynotes have you done this week? Four. Four? Good. I've one, got one left. Good. Uh, one main tent, three breakouts, and one left. Good. Great, well good luck with that. Uh, Inhi Chosa, thank you so much for coming on theCUBE, sharing your enthusiasm. You got, I don't know how you keep all this great information in your head, but uh, our listeners appreciate it. So great to see you as always. Oh, thank you very much. All right, keep it right there, thank everybody. You. We'll be right back with our next guest, Charles Long, who's the CEO of Centerline. This is a really good story. He was one of the uh, keynote speakers uh, uh, in the morning, and uh, we'll have him on next, so keep it right there. This is theCUBE, we'll be right back.